Um, I'd like to firstly thank Indira IVF for the opportunity to talk about vitrification. What I'm going to say today is applicable to both oocytes and embryos and is not for any particular um, procedure that is on the market at the moment. You're all quite aware of the process of vitrification, but what I want to talk mainly about is how to actually achieve good results with vitrification, high survival rates over 90%. And you can see here with Kobo's initial work where they were using donor cycles, that survival rates were over 90%. However, when they started to apply the exactly the same procedure with people trained in their clinic to IVF patients, the survival started to drop. And was this actually related to the patients that they were using or something specific to the vitrification procedure? So let's look at their procedure and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. You can see initially when we place the oocyte into the equilibration solution that it um, shrinks down in size and the water starts to move out very quickly out of the oocyte. Then it re-expands and it comes back to about 80% of its uh, initial volume. And at this stage, they then move the oocyte as soon as it had re-expanded into the VS solution. And they left it in the VS solution for less than 60 seconds. Um, at that time, they then loaded it on the cryolock with a minimum volume of around 0.1 of a microliter. Uh, for the warming procedure, uh, it's basically the reverse of that procedure where they've um, uh, reintroduced water by um, putting it first in one mole of sucrose at 37 degrees, and then they decrease the um, sucrose concentration down and finally placing it into their um, media. So one of the things that we do know about cells is that they have this um, membrane hydraulic permeability coefficient, which allows the water to move in and out of the cells. This dictates the speed at which the water moves and also the cryoprotectant. And you can see in a cohort of oocytes from the same patient that there's large variation in this hydraulic permeability coefficient between this oocyte here and this one. This one would take quite a long time to rehydrate and dehydrate, whereas this one would take quite a short time to dehydrate and rehydrate. So to apply just one time parameter is quite difficult for oocytes. And this is why initially they did this re-expansion um, as the critical moment. And you can see in a cohort of oocytes that we've collected from our clinic, where we have looked at fairly large numbers now, that there's quite a range of um, the rate at which the water has um, left the cell and the re-expansion time from four minutes right up to 12 minutes in some of these. And these are in quite young patients here. So there's variation amongst oocytes and this is even within the oocytes of the patient. So this will change the rate at which water will move. One of the other things that's critical in the first part of vitrification is the uh, process of which you actually add the oocyte to the ES solution. And in the top panel here, you see the protocol from the Kitazaro group. And this is also applicable to embryos where you've got the base media and then you're adding your ES solution to that base media. And as soon as this is added, you'll see often in many of the um, embryos and oocytes that they will start to float on the surface of this. And this is a critical point in the same um, situation in this, this is one of the other kits that's out there where they suggest that you place the embryo on the top of the solution and wait for it to actually sink to the bottom. That in this situation, um, you're actually exposing the oocyte or the embryo to just the air and only a small area of cryoprotectant. And we know how important it is to keep our oocytes and embryos in this nice sort of bath of solution and in the right um, air content. And so this is actually fairly detrimental. And we do know that oocytes that are treated this way will not survive the freezing procedure as well as those that have been placed directly under the solution. So one of the things that I would emphasize is not to do this and not to allow them to rise back up onto the surface of the solution, but to pull them back down so that they're being covered the whole time by the solution. 
in a similar fashion, the other method that's around is this merging of drops together um, from the base media to the ES and then to another drop of ES. And what happens in this situation is, depending on the size of the trough that's made between these two, you can actually dictate the concentration that is in each of these drops. And so therefore, you're not providing a consistent concentration for the oocyte or the embryo to be exposed to. And this then adds another variable to your vitrification procedure. So what we've done experimentally is to set up a model on which we can then look at different aspects of the vitrification to see what is critical and what isn't. And we basically use our GV and M1 oocytes that are not used for our ICSI. We mature these to metaphase two we apply exactly the same procedure that I showed Kobo uh, achieve those good results with, where we re-expand back out to this 80% and then move instantly into our vitrification solution. And then we um, then place it on our cryolog. And one of the points that I will bring up here is that we place our oocytes directly under the solution in a half a mil volume. And this is so that we're not seeing these changes of um, concentration throughout the solution as you do with some of those other methods. And our warming procedure is exactly the same warming procedure as I showed you before. And then we place them into culture for 24 hours to check the final survival at the end of the 24 hours. So our first parameter that we looked at is the time in the equilibration solution. So our first parameter is to apply the standard procedure of the re-expansion and then to add a fixed time of 10 minutes. And this is the survival you can see. So when we have a re-expansion where we let every oocyte dictate the time that it needs to be in the solution, we have this 90 over 90% survival. As soon as we set a fixed time, you can see our survival starts to drop. And this really suggests that there are some oocytes within the cohort that were frozen at this time that would have required a longer dehydration time than 10 minutes. So 10 minutes isn't sufficient time for, um, to cover all of the oocytes that are requiring to be dehydrated. Our next parameter we looked at is the effect of the uh, vitrification solution. So our standard procedure is to have it in the solution for less than 60 seconds and then load it onto our cryolock. The variation we've looked at is to leave it in that solution longer. So this is the situation where you might have lost the, the blastocyst or the oocyte in the solution, can't find it, then eventually find it, pick it up to load it. And then we've also compared it to this situation where we've left it in the VS solution longer. But what we've done is before we actually plunge the cryolock, We've let it sit in the air for 10 seconds. So this would be the situation where you're trying to remove that extra cryoprotectant that you might have applied onto the cryolock. And we wanted to see whether this would also have an impact on the survival. We also looked at the spindle and the chromosome alignment in these as well. And you can see here that when we've gone with the under 90 seconds, under 60 seconds, sorry, that we've got 90%. When we increase the time out to 90 seconds in that vitrification solution, it hasn't had an impact on survival. And this is something that many people worry about, that their um, survival would be diminished if they left it too long in, in the VS. We're not saying leave it in too long, but we're saying that a little bit longer is not as detrimental as people think. The thing that is detrimental is to have it exposed to that air sitting on the tool before you've actually plunged it. And this is likely to be because um, you're actually increasing the concentration of the cryoprotectant that's around that oocyte because it's drying out in the air. The next parameter we looked at is the, the volume on the cryolock and the standard volume that we have placed on the cryolock is less than 0.1 of a, mi a microliter. And this would be just a film over your oocyte. And then we've increased it to 0.5 of a microliter onto the cryolock. So we've measured the exact amount so we know exactly how much we're adding onto the cryolock with the oocyte. Again, you can see here's our standard and here's our much higher volume 
and that the higher volume really hasn't had an impact on the survival at all. So yes, you can leave that solution on the tool and not have to worry about trying to aspirate off all of that solution before you plunge them into the liquid nitrogen. One of the other areas that we've looked at is the warning. So the first warning step is at 37 degrees to 60 seconds. And some people seem to get a bit fast when they're starting to do the warm. Would 30 seconds have an impact and would 90 seconds have an impact? And you can see here that if we change the time to either a faster time or a slower time, that we've had a dramatic impact on the survival. So it's very critical that the oocytes or the um, blastocysts are sitting in the uh, first warming solution for the appropriate time before they're being moved into the second. One of the other things that is fairly critical, and you can see here this very dramatic drop in survival, it is if the, there's a fluctuation in the temperature between when you're uh, finished your vitrification and then moving it into the tank. So if at any time during that period, you have um, exposure to air that they're not covered with liquid nitrogen, you will get the temperatures rising up to around minus 70 degrees and even higher. And at that situation, you'll also get a decrease in survival. Similarly, if you're um, transporting uh, oocytes or embryos from one clinic to another, you can see here just this moving in and out of the tanks is also having an impact on the survival. And that's likely to be, again, due to a devitrification, revitrification system. So one of the hints that I would um, mention to you about transporting is that to eliminate this devitrification um, when you're moving uh, oocytes or embryos out of a dry shipper is to fill the, the dry shipper with liquid nitrogen as soon as um, you open it. So we basically dump in liquid nitrogen into the dry shipper and then once the little canisters are full with liquid nitrogen, we then move those into our smaller canister for doing our ID checks and then into our tank. And if we do um, transport this way, we haven't shown an impact on survival. So one of the other areas that we were interested in is could we actually achieve similar sorts of survival rates with a closed system? And we know, I won't really go through the background of the closed system because we're going to run out of time, but this is uh, to actually benefit in that we may not have any potential contamination um, as you see with a, an open system. And so we've done the same sort of procedure as before where we're using the rapid eye um, and we're going to compare that to the, the cryolock. And we've used the same procedure, we've used the same solutions all the way through and we then put some of the oocytes on the rapid eye and some of the oocytes on the cryolog. And this is our survival. You can see the survival here with the open system and this is with the closed uh, rapid eye system. And really these are equivalent. There was no significant difference. So this is the sort of numbers of um, oocytes that we vitrify. Most of our patients that we're vitrifying oocytes for uh, cancer patients and social egg freezing. We uh, don't do any donor work. And this is a procedure that we've stayed with uh, now where we've moved that time in the ES solution out to 12 minutes. We are very critical about this time in our VS solution. The oocytes uh, must sit in that for at least 30 seconds before we pick them up, but then they must be on the um, rapid eye before the one minute is up. And in the rapid eye, we know that the cooling rate is much lower, but um, you can see from our results that this hasn't had an impact. Here you can see the survival. These are our clinical results for the um, under 38 and the over 38 patients. And you can see that we've got uh, a 90% survival rate for um, the, uh, the rapid eye um, oocytes. So you can see that that slower cooling rate hasn't had an impact on the survival fertilization is similar to our fertilization for our fresh, our day two cleavage is similar, transfers is similar, um, our fetal heart rate is similar to our fetal heart rate for our fresh oocytes, and we haven't seen any increase in the miscarriage rate. 
This is now the new uh, modified Kitazado oh, well, um, that has now changed the method. Um, they have now changed it by uh, using, instead of adding an HSA, a, a cellulose component to it, and they've also used tree hollows. They can still obtain some of these high results, but again, um, not all clinics are getting the high results with this new modification to Kitazado. So um, in summary, insufficient time in the ES um, will slightly reduce the, the survival and it will depend on, on the oocytes as to the quality and whether they have equilibrated appropriately before being moved out of that. That a delay before plunging is terribly detrimental to the oocytes and that would be exactly the same for a blastocyst. Uh, inappropriate time in that one, in that one mole of sucrose also is very detrimental and that to overcome any issues with rise of temperature in our transport tanks it's important to decant liquid nitrogen into them as soon as you've opened them. We also know now that um, the rapid warming that occurs in the one molar solution, one molar sucrose solution is far more important than probably the cooling rate and that we can achieve similar rates with a, a slower cooling rate using the rapid eye system. The rapid eye um, we found was very easy to use and it's also um, getting very high survival rates similar to the open system and we see really no reason for um, making a choice uh, just because we have, um, others have said that a closed system doesn't work. We find in our hands with at least a rapid eye that the um, results are comparable um, with survival and also with our uh, developmental rates. And I also wanted to just quickly talk a bit about culture systems in the last couple of minutes. Um, we run a very uh, large clinic of around 6,000 cycles per year. We've been using a, um, a single step, um, the um, vitrolyze system uh, for a couple of years and have achieved very good results with these. Uh, basically, I think a couple of critical points um, to making your plates. We all are very aware of osmolarity changes for doing things like micro drops, and we have shown very clearly that this can have a huge impact on your results and can vary from patient to patient depending on whether it was the last plate or the first plate being made. So these are critical points for achieving good reproducible results with in your clinic. We also find that uh, low oxygen is far more beneficial for uh, us achieving embryos uh, to go to the, to get a high rate to blastocyst, but also for um, our timing points to make sure that they're actually achieving the, the right um, time points through the embryo development. We also know that quality of oil is also critical and the, since we've heard some of the comments about um, oil production being poor quality, that these are also critical to obtain really good blastocyst development rates in your um, culture system. So I think um, I've looked at the, the clinic here today and have been very impressed with the system, with the setup and also with the training here. And I hope that this might also benefit you today in uh, understanding of some of those critical parameters around vitrification. Thank you.